Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because we're gonna have somebody on the show today and what we're gonna talk about is work-life balance lies and secrets for today uh, because we have mark briggs who is the author of the butterfly impact now mark briggs actually grew up in Coeur d'Alene, idaho um beautiful town if you haven't been there you definitely want to go but he was surrounded by a loving family uh, a large group of close friends and constant adventure it was a storybook come to life he attended college at gonzaga university in spokane uh, with a plan to become a high school football coach both of his older sisters were in school there. He had cousins, aunts, and uncles who were Zag alumni too. It was a family thing. And if he learned nothing else from his parents who have been married for 55 years, he learned to cherish family at an early age. As a kid, Mark was a sports nut and especially loved football and basketball. From grade school through high school, he filled up notebooks with offensive plays that he had dreamed up. And sometimes his coaches would actually use the plays that he invented. Given how little he played in some of the games, he was happy to make an impact in any way he could. He discovered sports writing and journalism in college and then digital journalism in newspaper and TV and news and started writing books about it all. He also tried launching a couple of startup companies, but they didn't take off. For the past five years, and he has been helping media companies with change management and modernization projects. Over the past few years, conversations with his clients led to a new book project during the pandemic focusing on that work-life balance. He realized even before the pandemic that business strategy carried little impact if the people who needed to execute the strategy were burned out and stressed and overwhelmed. These conversations led him to publishing that book, Butterfly Impact, which is resilience, resets, and ripples. The through line connecting all the dots in his career, or what some would call his blue flame, is this, helping people find new ways to be successful. His first book, Journalism 2.0, was made possible by a grant from the Knight Foundation and was published in 2007 and translated into five languages and downloaded more than 200,000 times. Since then, he has worked with groups globally on finding new ways to be successful and has written three other books. In addition to writing books and working as management consultant, Mark is also a professor of leadership and change management at the University of North Carolina and teaches a similar, similar course for Aga Khan University in East Africa. Mark lives in Tacoma, Washington, and is proud to live in the Pacific Northwest, surrounded by mountain and water adventures, and he has two sons, ages 21 and 19, and a new rescue dog named Mars. He shares insights on innovation, work-life harmony, and leadership on LinkedIn and through a bi-weekly newsletter, and you can subscribe to that at butterfly-impact.com. Mark Briggs, are you ready to help us get over the hump? Absolutely. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, we had a great discussion uh, before we started recording, and we're going to hit on some, I think, really, you know, key elements that hopefully are going to provide, you know, clarity for for both individuals and organizations in regards to this whole mess associated, and I say mess um, because it has getting it's getting more complex in regards to work life balance. So, some people may have heard of the butterfly effect, or maybe even seen the movie with Ashton Kutcher uh, with that name. But, you know, I think it's important for us to start with trying to understand what is the difference between the butterfly effect and the butterfly impact? Well, as I saw a way to basically create an umbrella under all the disparate work-life balance lessons that I was collecting for this book, the butterfly effect resonated with me because, first of all, it's based on chaos theory, uh, which during a pandemic felt very appropriate. There was a lot of chaos happening. And what I really wanted to do though, was to recognize that very small changes can have really big effects downstream. And that's the essential element of the butterfly effect. Now the butterfly effect, however, is famous because you can't control them. So you know, the, the example that I'd point to in movies is Jurassic Park and Jeff Goldblum's character, 
who said a butterfly could flap its wings in Beijing and cause a rainstorm in Central Park. And that's a, you know, kind of a well-known uh, example of the butterfly effect. But for me, it was what I was trying to do was collect all these really small changes that an individual could make in their own life to have an outside effect on the people around them, both at work and at home, uh, to drive more progress, to obviously reduce stress and overwhelm, make themselves more productive, make their teams more productive at work, and really feel more valuable and engaged both at work and at home. And so it was this series of small changes that I collect and present in this book that I turned into the butterfly impact. Well, as I was reading it, you know, you talk about chaos theory and, and uh, like you said, I think a lot of people can associate with the whole chaos and, and some people have maybe even heard of the acronym about, you know, VUCA being in a VUCA world, volatile, unpredictable, and all of that. Uh, as I was going through it, I started thinking about dynamic systems theory, because here's the thing. While we do know when we start talking about the pandemic and the lockdown and how do we sort through that, that is very chaotic. However, we have to get out of that. And we are, we've had stops and starts and fits and starts to get out of that. And so then I started thinking about dynamic systems and how to move that forward. So how much do, I mean, and, and you actually talk about other systems and theories, how, how, how can an individual take all of these different theories and systems and start aligning them, maybe self-identifying them so that they can make those changes you're talking about? It's interesting you bring up VUCA. It's something I actually bring up quite often in workshops that I do with, with my clients because that volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity that that acronym represents can be transformed into problem solving and creativity, experimentation, and progress. And that's what I think all of us have, have learned in you know, what we've gone through in the pandemic and the ensuing years from it. You know, Inertia tells us that a body at rest tends to stay at rest and a body in motion tends to stay in motion. And for a lot of organizations and teams and even people and families, uh, that inertia hadn't changed much maybe. And what happened with the pandemic was everybody was forced to change in some way. And so it created this opportunity you know, on a global scale, this, this moment in time where everybody had to figure out, am I going to make progress? with my change that's being forced upon me, or am I just going to sort of grin and bear it or hunker down and wait for it to pass over me? And really what I've tried to present in the book where I, I interviewed more than a hundred people to get their takes on it. Cause I wanted to get, you know, sort of perspective from all walks of life and all kinds of different situations is here are some of the ways that you take that uncertainty, you take that change that's forced upon you and turn it into something positive and come out of it a better team, a better person, a better parent, partner, spouse, uncle, friend, whatever role you happen to play. And, you know, this pandemic has, as a silver lining, has given everyone the opportunity to make that change in a positive direction. Well, and there's a couple of questions that I have as a result of that. But one part of the book you had talked about, you know, some of these butterfly impact type changes and it may cause pause for me. You said something about how we can't predict what their downstream or you know effect is going to be. You're talking about that Jeff Goldblum example. We don't know if that flapping over there is going to cause that rainstorm. But but to me though, as you were going through the story, I'm like, I, it seemed like that was in conflict because it seemed like me to me like you were saying that these would and co could cause some more predictable outcomes. Tell me how how I'm missing something in there. The missing element really is, is faith, maybe a little bit of hope. And so a simple example is to take an extra couple of minutes to prepare for that Zoom meeting at work and bring a different energy to it than just showing up and sort of grinning and bear it and sort of trudging through it. If you show up with some positive energy, maybe even like a funny video that takes 30 seconds or a funny meme, or if you're leading the meeting and you start it, and it might be Thursday. So you're going to all of a sudden turn it into thankful Thursday and you go around the Zoom and everybody says something they're thankful for. You yourself are, more, are only going to see the impact for a moment, maybe 30 or 60 minutes on that Zoom call with 12 people. But those other 11 people then take that positive energy, take that moment, and they might go do something else with it that you can't see. But the faith that 
taking this 60 minute opportunity, making it better for you and for those 12 people, then I'm hoping and I'm actually sure that it's going to have a ripple effect in the next hour for those 11 people and then on and on and on from there. So I, I want to say, do your best, right? Exactly. <laughs> do your best always. <laughs> exactly. Well, okay. Now in the book, in all the stories that you were sharing about how others have been able to essentially de debunk, you know, some of the fallacies associated with, with work like balance, uncover some of their own, you know, secrets and secrets of others, you know, and how to actually find, and you even call it something different than balance. Um, maybe you should talk about that too. But I, I, I started looking at all of the words that I have heard throughout the course of many years, authenticity, values. I mean, um, Carol Dweck's work on fixed mindset and growth mindset. I started seeing all these common things uh, that we hear a lot of. And so, I, you know, I, it goes back to, you know, creating our own plan and figuring out and self-diagnosing, uh, you know, and taking that right action. Um, so if I, if I were to say the common thing in regards to impact, what are some of the common things that were reinforcing, you know, or maybe even refuted some of the things you thought previously? I think connecting your values to the time that you spend on your activities, whether they are at work or outside of work and really doing an assessment and this is something I recommend in the book. I talked to several people who have done this successfully is to say, if these are the things I value and I look at my calendar for the next week, where are they? Do they show up? If I color coded my calendar and I color coded my values, what, what colors would I see? And I think what a lot of folks have done over time is they always say, yes, a new meeting comes up, a new obligation, a new commitment. And suddenly they're overwhelmed and their calendar is, is now overstuffed with what they think is important, but they don't stop and take a look and say, what does this have to do with what I th say to myself that I value? Because if I say to myself, these are the things I value, if I, if I say I value health and fitness and I don't have a single block of time dedicated towards working out yoga or walking how do I actually justify that that's one of my values? So I think that's one of the most important things. And, and that would, for me, that resonates and makes a lot of sense. Um, but then it goes back to the whole self-assessment piece uh, to be able to identify those values. And I think, I, and you would even attest, I'm sure, you know, by reading through and talking about that, you know, idyllic core de lane and idyllic family setup and how you always you know, work to try to be able to obtain that in your own life and had some issues with feeling like you weren't able to do so and didn't want it to impact your, your, your boys. Um, you know, but I, I, you know, how, how, how do you actually, you know, take the value concept? Because some people say, well, I didn't even figure that out until I was in my forties and fifties. And that's what the, um, the whole, you know, midlife crisis thing was. I finally realized my values, you know, how do I find my values more rapidly? That's a really good question because your values could change and probably will change over time and depending on how old you were. And like you say, I grew up in a fantastic, wonderful, I won't say perfect, nobody's perfect, but a pretty darn good family and pretty darn good life where as a kid, you know, my my job at, at in sixth grade or my, not my job, but what I did every day was gather up with a group of friends and we'd get on our bikes and we'd ride downtown and we'd jump off of rocks into the lake and I mean, it was, it really was as good as it gets as far as an upbringing goes. And, you know, my, my parents have been fantastically supportive of me as my path has taken a lot of twists and turns that theirs never did. And so, you know, when I went through my first divorce, I had to come back to my values. So my lifelong goal at that point was really to just rebuild the family that I grew up in. And then suddenly that was taken away from me. So I had to you know, kind of reassess and again, identify with my values again and keep moving forward. And then it became all about, you know, how do I create the life for my kids that is the best possible situation for them? And so that value didn't change. So I was able to continue pursuing that. And over time, I think, you know, as we get older, we're going to add more values um, and we're going to add a shifting 
priority. Um, I really loved last year reading the book by uh, David Brooks called The Second Mountain, where he talked about the first mountain being your career and possibly money and, and a, a, a attaining things. And you get to the top of that and you're like, yeah, but what else is there? And the second mountain is what's the impact that I can have on other people? And so, you know, at a later stage, as I am, uh, you start thinking about climbing that second mountain and what's the other impact you can have on people. And so you end up in my life, I think, and the people around me end up adding values as you go, right? Because you, you have more to give than you do in your early stages of life. So they continue to shift, but I think it's important to always have a real clear sense of what they are at any given time. So that, you know, again, back to what I was talking about earlier, where you're spending your time is on what you value, at least as much as possible. Uh, for, um, I had a guest previously on the show. His name was Rick Miller, and he he left me with a, a quote that just resonates. And this was a couple of years ago. He said, until you know where you stand, it's not possible for you to take a stand. Yeah. At all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that, that resonates uh, in Absolutely. so many different ways. Yeah, for sure. So we talk about, you know, again, we're talking about, you know, in an organization, we talk about a culture, we're talking about, you know, impacting the customer experience and, and, but yet we're talking about all of these other things. So it leads me to ask the question, you know, as you were doing your research and, you know, you know, looking at all of these, you know, theories and practical applications, what are some of the things that you've seen where you're like, you know what, and not casting any blame or anything, but, you know, you're saying like, as far as work-life balance goes, that's just a lie about work-life balance. What are some of those things that kind of stand out? It's interesting that balance has kind of been uh, attacked, you know, I think in the past six to nine months, certainly in the circles that I, I'm reading. And, you know, I talk about in the book is work-life blending um, because I do, I don't think it can be like a balance where there's the same amount of both all the time. I don't think that's actually the, the goal anyway, but I do believe that if, as people, especially those of us who work from home uh, have had to blend our work with our home life, um, and especially if you have kids at home and there's homeschooling involved, or maybe there's other people to care for, uh, there definitely is a blending of work and life. And that can be done, I think, outside of what traditional norms could be. And whether it's, you know, setting boundaries on the emails that you're not going to respond to after 7 p.m. or on the weekends, whatever those things might be. Um, but I think that one of the of the uh, recommendations that I'm constantly giving my clients is have those conversations about what are the boundaries that as a team we value now, now that we have had to work life balance and blend, what is the expectation? If I get an email on a Saturday, let's talk about it because a lot of organizations have never had that conversation. So if your boss sends you an email on a Saturday, you just assume you better respond to it to make yourself look responsive, to make yourself look like you've, you've got it all under control. And I think that one of the lies about um, work-life balance in, in this day and age is that anybody has it totally under control. And I think that honestly presenting yourself as here's where I need to have a boundary in order for me to be the best performer that you want me to be, and we have that agreement, it's going to be better for the team. It's going to be better for me and my family. Then that boundary makes a lot of sense because to not have any boundaries, we go too far in just making these assumptions and expectations that, Hey, just because 10 years ago, everybody worked 80 hours a week in this organization. And we all were on our email over, over the weekends. Doesn't mean we have to do it today. Let's take a look at the ROI on that. What was the cost of that? And I've seen some people who have been around for decades look back at those older cultures and understand that that was a significant cost that didn't make sense. You know, staying in your office and warming a chair till 7:30 at night because your boss was still at his office and making yourself busy until he walks out and then you can close up and then you can walk out, which is a story I heard just recently. Um, what was the ROI on that? Like, what was the return on investment for you personally, for your family, for the organization? And those are the conversations that we get to have now, I think, because of the pandemic. So it is one of the silver linings that we can put those cards out on the table and understand what is the best for everybody involved. As you're talking, I start also wanting to think about 
you know, some of maybe the generational differences. And I don't want I don't know if we can even say, you know, Gen X, Gen Z, millennial, you know, what, boomer, whatever. I don't know if that's it because, you know, I, many, many years ago, um, and I don't know how it came to me as far as a source. Uh, I can't even say I was the source, but I, I had the opportunity to, to be in an environment where I was responsible for uh, the work of over 800 people. And uh, I, I had said something to the effect of that I've been blessed. I've had the opportunity to, you know, lead 18 year old men and 65 year old boys. That's um, good. Because, you know, it, you know, it, I think there's a whole lot of factors that go into having the values, if you want to call them that, and having the expectation of, you know, I am going to be the first one to show up and I'm going to be the last one to leave. And you know what? I'm expecting my people to do the same thing. Right. Uh, and that is a certain type. And this is where you talk about culture, you know, and fit and expectation setting. And um, also, this is also could be where the authenticity, you know, comes into play. It's like, well, you're saying that I have the flexibility, but then you're saying if I'm not here, then there and this, that and the other or in these specifics, um, it's not ringing true. And, that, and that's a disconnect for me. And I don't trust you and I'm out of here. Uh, so it, is it, you know, really getting into some of differences associated with the values, you know, or is it a certain situation where, you know what, just as some of these older folks who lead these organizations go away, we'll be able to have, you know, the organizations that enable, you know, these better environments. Well, I would agree with you that it's not an age or generational thing because, you know, we've, learned plenty of really bad habits from startup culture in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And I think that what's we, what we're coming to understand is that the people working 80 hours a week and the people that, you know, are constantly too busy to make time for you to grab coffee or jump on a zoom call or, you know, do something after work are not necessarily the people that have their stuff together. They're mm -hmm. not necessarily the people that are making an impact. Um, the number of meetings you have during a day doesn't have a direct line correlation to the amount of impact you're making on an organization. And I think one of my least favorite words in life and especially work is optics. And I have been the uh, victim of a few situations where things went not the way I wanted them to go because of quote unquote optics. And I feel like optics is getting retired slowly. Uh, and I think that cult of busy that I wrote about in the book, which is a term that I get from my author friend, Scott Birkin, is so apropos for this time, because the idea that, that how busy you are is how valuable you are, I think is just really outdated. And it doesn't matter if you're a 22-year-old CEO, startup founder of a tech company, or a 64-year-old CEO of a major organization. Just because you're busy doesn't mean you're valuable. And you can be valuable without having, you know, 10 hours of zoom calls a day. Okay. So that start, starts leading us into, uh, you know, much of what you were talking about in the book. Um, and part of the title is that, you know, that impact element, you know, really not being done in the, in the isolation of a meeting, you know, but being done more in a community environment. And you and I had a discussion before we started recording about the differences between, Oftentimes what gets confused with, you know, pleasure, you know, and happiness. Uh, and a lot of times those two get switched out. But if you can help provide a little bit of clarity on really kind of the science and how you get to happiness. It's interesting how much um, study and research obviously has been done on happiness sort of as an individual sport. And when I started researching the topic of work-life happiness, you understand really quickly that it can't be solely up to you uh, in a work situation because there's always other humans involved. And so one of the chapters in the book is called work is a team sport because it, it is for most people interacting with other people is going to uh, have a pretty good effect on how much happiness you actually have at work, which then of course has a ripple effect to the energy you're bringing to your outside of work situation, your home life, the people around you, um, whether they're friends or family. And so to me, it's all very interconnected. And, and, you know, as you talked about it in the beginning, like 
happiness is uh, going to release the dopamine in your brain, whereas having a great collaboration with colleagues is going to release that serotonin in your brain and is going to make you feel actually happier uh, for a longer period of time. And I think it has a longer staying power and more ripple effect than sort of that individual dopamine effect and that hit you get maybe off of that funny TikTok you just watched during your break. So to me, it's, it's a huge investment that you make in fostering the best collaboration with the people that you work with the most. And I know personally, there have been times where I was just having a tough day, feeling stressed about maybe a project. I wasn't sure how I was going to deliver and how I was going to fit everything in. And I, then I would get on a call with somebody, a work call that was scheduled and the sort of sparks of collaboration, idea sharing, and then just hearing someone else and offering their perspective and having some empathy and being able to help them potentially solve a problem and how that made me feel is the best drug I can find personally. And I, I guess that's maybe what I'm trying to do with the book is try to share that impact that those kinds of interactions have had on me and how much impact they could have on others as well. So one of the things for us, which we, uh, you know, we're talking about culture, we talk about, you know, individual impacts, we talk about leader and leadership, and uh, is that we, we're, all of us, if we start talking about in an organization, I think what we're ultimately trying to impact and affect is the value of our organization. So that means customers, right? That means obtaining customers, retaining customers, serving customers. So how does the butterfly impact as you see it with all of these examples and all this research that you conducted impact the customer experience? Well, I always start with listening and feedback and that, you know, kind of empathy that any, you know, organization needs for their audience or their customers uh, to fully understand how to, you know, solve their problem, fill their need, you know, produce something of value, um, make something people want. That's really at the end of the day, what business usually comes down to. And in my experience, the more that you listen internally as an organization to one another, the better you will be at listening to those outside of your organization. And so I think you're not going to create the, the right product or service to match the market um, to find that product market fit until you figure out the cultural balance and really the cultural health of your organization so that you can have that kind of empathy for one another that then extends out to the customer. And then you can have that product development, that iteration, you're going to be able to make changes. I mean, the I think what we've all learned in business over the past two years and 10 years really is that an initial idea is, is pretty easy. It's executing the idea and continuing to adapt the idea and pivot to meet market needs and changing audiences that really tells the story of success. And so a healthier organization is going to be a more adaptable organization. And so if people are really good at working together, collaborating at teamwork, at you know establishing boundaries, at being really healthy when they show up to work and so they can perform at their highest level, then you're obviously going to have the best chance to serve the customers in the best possible way. Well, it kind of goes back to the old example that you were talking about. And I think that, you know, the visual is like, if, if we're flapping these wings internally, <laughs> the effect yeah. will be felt externally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, goodness. I mean, when you start talking about, you know, um, for some of us, and even in these case study examples you were talking about, you know, we, we carry a lot of these things with us and that we're continually trying to, you know, achieve something that we want, you know, as a golden objective. Um, and we need to have, you know, inspiration. Um, we need to have, and talked about the, you talked about the motivation and there's, you know, a body of research on that, uh, you know, what, what actually creates motivation for people that I think we all, you know, can learn more of, because we're learning more and more about, you know, human motivation and what, you know, actually generates and creates and sustains it. Um, but, but if, if you look at, you know, this whole, you know, transformation effort, um, we have to have inspiration throughout the way, because it's a journey, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, we look on the show for quotes that help to inspire us and to help hold, uh, you know, that focus and give that inspiration. Is there a quote or two that you like that you can share? 
I always go back to, um, and I know it's it maybe one you've already used, but uh, I think that pro- uh, the fact that change is inevitable and progress is optional is the one that I've used probably more than any uh, in my life. Uh, and this goes back to, you know, like I said, I've been through not just one, but two divorces. I've been through some other family difficulties. Uh, I've launched and watched uh, Sunset, a couple of startup companies. So I've been through the roller coaster ride. And if I've learned anything, it's that change is inevitable. But with every setback, I feel like I made progress. And I feel like that sort of has been the guiding principle through it all is that I, you know, kind of um, adopted that in my 20s that change was going to come no matter what. And so how do you make progress? Some of those changes, you know, you get to make yourself, you know, you can do things like I went to grad school and got a master's degree and that changed my career in a very positive way. Some of the changes like a pandemic, you don't get to choose and they're coming your way. But if you have already embraced the fact that change is going to come, so make progress, you'll be better, much better off. Well, you gave a lot of, uh, you know, personal examples about times where you have really gotten over the hump is, is what we refer to. And uh, they are very inspiring stories. Uh, and you've shared glimpses of those as we've had our discussion. Um, but if you can kind of give people some insight into time when you've had to get over the hump and what happened. Yeah, there's been a few, uh, lots to choose from there, I suppose. Um, I think that, you know, probably the, you know, the, the divorces that I went through were certainly the most challenging. Um, the second divorce that when that happened, it it was very uh, traumatic uh, on me and on my kids. And it was in a situation work-wise where I was really stretched. I had a very brutal long commute. So hours in the day were, uh, incredibly uh, precious. And to try to manage a transition uh, out of a home situation that um, was frankly dangerous while you know maintaining high performance at work uh, and maintaining, I was also teaching uh, a university class on the side at University of North Carolina. So I was what you would describe as incredibly busy, um, but first and foremost was trying to make sure that my two kids were supported and cared for and, you know, trying to protect their health and well-being. So what I learned real quickly was you had to set boundaries, keep boundaries and prioritize. And the other thing I really learned that I tried to make sure came through in this book is you got to take care of yourself. And if you can't take care of yourself first and foremost, none of the rest of it matters because it just won't go as well. And so even despite all of the upheaval that I had been going through to still find time to exercise and to eat well and to get sleep and do those things that I know people, you know, sort of shake their head at, like, I don't have time for all that. Well, if you did make time for that, you would actually be much more effective in every other area of your life. So it is the ROI on that is, you know, obviously incredible, well-proven. There's tons of research around it. Um, so that I think is, is a good example of like, even when it feels like, okay, but this is really extreme point in my life. I, I, I don't, just don't have time for that. That's when you have to make the time for it because in order to actually execute what you need to do to do all those different things on all those different fronts, I had to be the best you know, performing person that I could possibly be. And so that was, uh, that was a lesson well-learned and one that I continue to use today. And some people just never do learn those things, right? <laughs> some people uh, still, they, they, they keep saying next week or yes. next year or next month. Yes. So for me, uh, one of the things that I talking about, you know, having to be really, uh, you know, have some stick to it and resilience on um, is sleep. Uh, because for a very long period of time, you know, four hours a night is what I was doing. And uh, I just couldn't sustain it. And I had done it for seven, eight years. And I, you know, and that's part of what my pandemic epiphany was, is I can't, I, I'm not going to come out of this and continue to do that. I just could not. Uh, and here's an interesting fact, an interesting fact, my entire life, I have been uh, an anxious nail biter. My entire life. And 
being more mindful of getting sleep. Of course, doing some other things, but I now have fingernails that I have to cut and file the craziest thing. <laughs> that's so funny that you, that's how it manifested it itself in you. Um, but the point well taken, I, I found a term, ran across a term 10 or 15 years ago from a military general who would say in battle that uh, what they pursued was sleep discipline. Hmm. And so I felt like at the time, if you, I'm not in battle, I, you know, I'm literally not on a battlefield and worried about being shot or bombed overnight. Uh, if those people can practice sleep discipline, then I certainly should be able to. Most definitely. Uh, and another uh, lesson, especially from those special forces uh, people is in order for them to not lose, lose it, you know, and keep their cool is uh, really focusing in on breathing and deep breathing. Yeah. And there are so many things that are just simple and available to us. If we would just do it, just do it. Yeah. Do it. It's the doing that's, that's the difficult part for people. That's right. Okay. So you got the book, you've had a couple other books, you're doing some consulting, you're teaching at UNC. Um, you're also teaching um, at, at the other school in East Africa. Uh, but when I look at all the things that you have going and where you are um, and talking about this is uh, what's one of your goals that you still are looking to obtain? You know, the goal right now is to just, I said, like I said earlier, that second mountain, um, I want to figure out what that exactly looks like. Uh, I think I've been able to seize some opportunities uh, in my career thus far to help, you know, a lot of people with different aspects of innovation and change management and just finding ways to do things better, um, generally in the news and media space. But I still feel like there's a second mountain out there for me, and I haven't really identified what that is, but my goal is to definitely identify it and then start climbing it. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Mark, the Hump Day Hoedown is a part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions and your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us to move onward and upward faster. Mark Briggs, are you ready to hoe down? Let's do it. All right. So what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? Probably ego, probably the inability to be as vulnerable as needed to be as effective as I could be. And what is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Listen first, ask second. And what do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Positive energy that gives a sense of we can do anything. And what would be one book that you'd recommend to the Fast Leader Legion? It could be from any genre. Of course, we're going to put a link to the butterfly effect on your show notes page as well. Or imp butterfly impact. Sorry, the butterfly impact. My book is uh, that I recommend is Prime to Perform by Lindsay McGregor and Neil Doshi, um, Play, Purpose, and Potential. They have found and they preach and I preach with them is the best way to build an adaptable team culture and individual person. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net and doing a search for Mark Briggs, M-A-R-K-B-R-I-G-G-S. Okay, Mark, this is my last hump day out on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25 and you can take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only take one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? I would take resilience. Uh, I, at that point, when I was 25, I had, I had not been through the ringer and I hadn't been through all the ups and downs. Um, but boy, it'd be nice to have even at that early age. Mark Briggs, I had a fun time chatting with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, and then, like you said earlier, my website and newsletter is at butterfly-impact.com. Mark Briggs, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. And thank you for helping us all get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster.